Now for our module 14.2, so looking at energy methods, but now looking at loading. So within the loading, we're going to look at impact loading, talk about the analysis and design. Then we're going to look at single loads and talk about energy formulation and deflections. And then we're also going to get into some special topics here dealing with work and energy under multiple loads, Castigliano's theorem, deflections by Castigliano's theorem, and then statically into permanent structures as well. So activities within this module, again, we're going to go through the theory for the above topics, look at our governing equations, talk about some practical applications, and then go through some problem solving together. So let's take a look at the topic of impact loads. Within our impact loads, we want to consider this rod BD. So this is our rod BD. It has some length L. Goes, there's our D. There's our B. It has a uniform cross-sectional area. Area is equal to A that we can see up here in our diagram. Now, this rod is going to be hit at the end B over here by this mass M that's traveling at this velocity V0. Now, as this rod deforms, we can see it's deforming this distance right here, our X sub M under the impact, stresses are going to develop within the rod and reach a maximum value of a sigma sub m. Now after vibrating for a while, the rod will come to rest and all the stresses are going to disappear. Now this load arising from a hit by a moving mass with a velocity, this is what's known as impact loading. So as the rod deforms under impact and we get this maximum stress, our sigma sub m, we ask ourselves, how can we determine this? How can we calculate this? Well, in order to find our sigma sub m, the first thing that we want to do is assume that our kinetic energy is transferred entirely to the structure. So if we assume that, we have our relationship shown in equation 11.33. We have our u sub m is equal to 1 half m v naught squared, where m is our mass over here that's coming in at that velocity v naught. So plugging those two in there, we can now get our value for our u sub m from our equation 11.33. Now another assumption that we're going to make is that our stress-strain diagram obtained from our static test is also valid under impact loading. So with these assumptions, the maximum value of our strain energy can be shown here in our equation 11.34, where we have that our u sub m is equal to the integral. Now we do have that value. There's our sigma sub m, our max stress right there, squared, all over 2e. So there's our modular elasticity that we could obtain from our stress-strain diagram, dv. So there's our governing equation here that does involve our maximum stress, our sigma sub m. So with that, we can rearrange this. And for the case of a uniform rod, we can simplify this down, do out our math. And what we end up with is 11.35 in our textbook, where it says that our sigma sub m, which is our maximum stress, is equal to the square root of 2 times that u sub m times our modulus elasticity e all over v. So we can simplify that down a little bit more with what we have up above from our relationship from equation 11.33. So now we have that our sigma sub m, our maximum stress, is equal to the square root of our m v naught squared. So that's our m of our mass here and our initial velocity v right there, times the modulus elasticity of our material all over v. And this is going to be our sigma sub m or our maximum stress. So now I want to take a look at a conceptual application for impact. So if we're dealing here now with a stepped rod impacted by a body of mass m, so there's our body of mass m, our initial velocity v naught. Now we can see here that this is a stepped rod, so we can see our area is 4a here, so 4 times the area over here, which is just our area a. So that's our section bc, has the area of 4a. Our section cd here has the area of a, and we can see they both have the same length of 1 half l. So now we can go down to our problem statement. It tells us that a body of mass m, so there's a body of mass m right there, and the velocity v naught hits the end of a non-uniform rod, that's our non-uniform rod, b, c, d, uh, knowing that the diameter of portion b, c, that first portion is going to be twice the diameter of our portion c, d, they ask us to then determine the maximum value of the normal stress in the rod. So now that we've had an opportunity to read through that problem statement and take a look at our initial diagram, the next step is to come up with a procedure for our solution. So as we're looking through our procedure for analysis, we notice that due to the change in diameter, the normal stress distribution is going to be non-uniform. So this is our change in diameter. This diameter is going to be double that diameter there. Now, within our procedure, the next thing we want to do is find that static load P sub m, which produces the same strain energy as the impact. So we want to replace this by some static load P sub m over here. And then we're going to, from there, go ahead and evaluate the maximum stress resulting from that static load P sub m. So that'll be the first step, is finding that equivalent static load P sub m, which produces the same strain energy as the impact. So now that we've created that procedure for analysis, we can begin our solution. So for our solution, first we want to recall that due to that change in diameter, 
our B sub C is going to be a larger diameter than our C to D, then our normal stress distribution is going to be non-uniform. So for this, we can go through our procedure for analysis and recall some of our equations from earlier in the module. We'll take a look first at our equation 11.33 that gives us that our U sub M is equal to 1 half M V naught squared. So there's our mass M there, there's our V naught right there. Now we also have a relationship here from 11.34 where our U sub M is equal to our sigma sub M squared all over 2E dV. And this is not going to be equal to just our sigma sub M squared V over 2E. So now that we have those governing equations, 11.33 and 11.34, now we can go up here and we go back to our procedure for analysis and recall that we want to find this static load P sub M, which produces the same strain energy as the impact. So how can we do that? Well, we can take a look at our equation 11.14 that shows us that our U sub M is equal to, now this is going to be for this, adding both of these sections of the rod of different diameter together, we have our P sub M squared times that length of L over 2, so you can see this is an L over 2 and L over 2 for both those sections, all over our AE, plus now our P sub M squared L over 2 for the other side here, all over 4AE, because we can see we have an area of 4A and an area of A there. So that's what we're doing there is adding those two together. We do out our math here, and we end up with this 5 16th times that static load P sub M squared times the total length of this L all over AE, our cross-sectional area times our modular elasticity. So for that there, what we can do is rearrange and solve for our P sub M. When we do that, we find that our P sub M is equal to the square root of 16 over 5 uh, times our U sub M AE all over L. This again is all under that radical there. So we can use that in order to solve for, now we have an expression for our P sub M. So now that we have this expression for our P sub M, or our static load, the next thing that we want to do is evaluate our maximum stress resulting from that static load P sub M. So in order to do that, we can use our general governing equation here that our sigma sub M is equal to that P sub M right there all over A. So what we can do now is take this expression, plug it back in here, and what we end up with is that our sigma sub M or our maximum stress is equal to the square root of 16 over 5 times our U sub M E all over A L. Well, we realize for our U sub M, we have a relationship for that from equation 11.33 over here. So we can take this expression, 1 half M V naught squared, plug it in for our U sub M here, and then what we end up with is this expression down here that our sigma sub M, or our maximum stress, is equal to the square root of 8 over 5 times our M V naught squared E all over A L. Now we can reduce this down a little bit more, and we end up with now our sigma sub m, or our maximum stress, is equal to 1.265 times the square root of m v naught squared all, times e all over a l. So if we had values for our m, for our v naught, and for this length l here, and our dimensions to give us our cross-sectional area, as well as what type of material this was for our modular elasticity, we could plug all that information in there and get a numerical value for our sigma sub m or our maximum stress. So let's take a look at another type of impact problem in our concept application 11.7. In this problem here, what we're looking at is a falling weight on a cantilever beam. So it tells us in our problem statement that we have a block of weight w, so there's a block of weight w up here, is dropped from this height H onto the free end down here at point A of a cantilever beam, which is fixed to the wall at point B over here. It has a length of L. Now with this, they want us to determine the maximum value of the stresses in the beam. So again, we're going to go through and come up with a procedure for analysis for this problem here based upon what they give us in our problem statement in our initial diagram. So for our solution, one thing that we can notice here is that the normal stress is going to vary linearly along the length of the beam and across the transverse section. So from there, what we're going to do is we're going to find a static load, P sub M, just like we did in the previous example problem, which produces the same energy as that impact. From there, we'll evaluate the maximum stress resulting from that static load, P sub M. So now we can step through our procedure for analysis as we begin our solution to this problem. So for our solution, we recall in the first part here that the normal stress varies linearly along the length of the beam and across the transverse section. So we can have our energy equation here. In this case here, this is going to be potential energy. So if we recall, potential energy is mgh there. So our mg is our weight here of our falling block, and our height is our h value right there. So our u sub m is equal to wg, which would be the same as our mgh. Now this is equal, as we recall from our equation 11.34, this is equal to the integral of our sigma sub m, there's our maximum stress squared, all over 2 times our modular elasticity, dv. 
So with these governing equations here, now we can go on and try to look for our static load P sub M, which is going to produce that strain, same strain energy as the impact. So for our particular case here, where we have an N loaded cantilever beam, our strain energy relationship is given by our equation that U sub M is equal to our P sub M squared times L cubed all over 6 EI. And our impact load from this here, if we were to re rearrange that equation, our P sub M is equal then to the square root of 6 UM times our EI over L. So all we've done is take the strain energy relationship for an N loaded cantilever beam, rearranged it, and solve for our P sub M or our static load, which again is going to produce that same strain energy as the impact. So now we have this governing equation right here for our impact load relating it to our static load P sub M. So now that we have this general expression for our P sub M for our static load, which is produces the same strain as our impact load, what we can do next is evaluate the maximum stress resulting from that static load P sub M here. So we recall our governing equation, our sigma sub M for a cantilever beam that we're dealing with here is equal to our moment m sub m times c all over i, where our m sub m here, this moment, is going to be this force here, the static load piece of m that we're doing at point a times this distance l is going to give us that moment. So replace our m right here, magnitude over m sub m, with p sub m times that length lc all over i. Now with this here, we know that we have an expression now for our p sub m up above here, so we can take this relationship and plug it in for our p sub m there. So this says now that our sigma sub m or our maximum stress is equal to the square root of 6 u sub m e all over l times our i sub c, i over c squared. Well now for our u sub m, we have a relationship over here for our potential energy, our mgh. So our u sub m is equal to wh that we can plug in here for our u sub m. So now we can simplify this down even further and our sigma sub m or our maximum stress is equal to the square root of 6, now times this wh from this relationship here, times our modular elasticity all over the total length l times that i over c squared. And that's going to give us an equation that we can plug into to solve for that sigma sub m or our maximum stress. So let's take a look at the design for impact loads. So for this, I want to take a look at three different scenarios. First, we're going to take a look at our uniform rod. Now, we can see an example for our uniform rod in our top left diagram here. Then we'll also take a look at the case of our non-uniform rod, which is shown in this diagram here. And last, we'll take a look at the case of our cantilever beam. So this is our cantilever beam down here on the bottom. So one thing that we want to consider with this is that our maximum stress, that sigma sub m, this can be reduced by the uniformity of stress, low modulus elasticity with high yield strength, and large volumes. So all three of these things, if we're in the design process and we want to try to find a way to reduce that maximum stress, we can look at all three of those scenarios there. How can we go through and design this for a uniformity of stress? Maybe the dimensions, the shape, things of that nature. The low modulus elasticity. So how can we change that? Well, we can change a material type right there and a large volume, which again, we can play around with our dimensions and make this a larger volume there. So these are all things that we can do to reduce that maximum stress. So for each of these three scenarios, we have some different governing equations. So we'll take a look first at this diagram on the top left. So this is the case of our uniform rod. So we can see here, it's got a constant diameter, a constant area for the entire length from B to D here, and the entire length is L. And we can see this is an impact load. We have our mass here and our initial velocity, V naught right there. So for this case here, we can go to our equation 11.35 in our textbook, where our sigma sub m is equal to the square root of 2 u sub m e over v. So this is going to be our max stress given by this relationship here. And we have other equations that we can plug in for our u sub m for this scenario here for the uniform rod. So now let's take a look at the next case over here for the non-uniform rod. So for the non-uniform rod, we can see from the section B to C here, this has a different area and a different diameter than what we see over here in our section from C to D, where we have this area A right here. This is halfway through, so each of these is going to have a length of 1 half L to make the whole length of the rod from B to D a total length of L there. Then we have our mass M here, and we have our initial velocity V right there. So for this case here, we have that our sigma sub M, or our max stress, is equal to the square root of 16 over 5 times that U sub M times our modulus elasticity all over A E there. Now we also have a relationship down here for V. V is going to be equal to, our volume is going to be equal to 4 times our area times L over 2 for the first case over here. And then we're going to have it be 
uh, on the left hand side. Then we're going to have the add the right hand side of x is a non uniform rod of a times l over 2 for the volume there. So our total volume is going to be equal to 5al over 2. So with that there, we can then draw, write our equation from 11.36b in our textbook here. The sigma sub m or our max stress is equal to the square root of 8 times that u sub m times e all over our volume V. And where we get that from there is this relationship here. We can see on the top up here, we have this 5 over AL. There's our 5 over AL there. Then our half, so our 16 reduces down to an 8 there. So that's how we can reduce this relationship for our sigma sub M for our max stress down to equation we see in 11.36B here for this non-uniform rod. So let's take a look at the case for our cantilever beam. So for our cantilever beam, we have the governing equation, sigma sub M. Now, sigma sub m is equal to the square root of 6 u sub m e all over l times that i over c squared. So let's take a look at that denominator there, this l over i c squared. So this is going to be equal to, when we plug in for our i for cantilever beam, l times 1 quarter pi c to the fourth divided by c squared. So we can reduce this down. We can see our c squared and our c to the fourth. Reduce that down, cancel. We end up with 1 fourth pi c squared l. Well, this pi c squared L is our volume, so therefore this is equal to 1 quarter V. So our L times our I over C squared is equal to 1 quarter V, so we can plug that back in for the denominator up here in our sigma sub M, or our maximum stress equation there. So our sigma sub M is now equal to the square root, when we plug this back in, of 24 times U M E all over our volume there, which is given by our equation 11.36 C in our textbook. So now we want to take a look at work and energy under a single load. So previously what we found was that we could find our strain energy by integrating the energy density over the volume. So for a uniform rod, what we have here was our strain energy, our capital U, was equal to the integral of our lowercase u or our strain energy density right there, dv. So then we can plug in for this here, and this ends up being the integral of our stress, our sigma squared, over 2e dv there. Well, we can reduce this down further, plug in for our sigma and plug in for our dv. When we do that, what we end up with is the integral from zero to L over the whole length of our rod right there of our P1 over A, our load, over our cross-sectional area squared that replaces our sigma squared on the top here, all over 2E, which is our modular elasticity, times A dx. So times our area times the dx as we're moving in the x direction right here. There's our x right there along the length of that uniform rod. So once we do out that integral there, pull out our constants, we end up finding out that our U here, or our strain energy for a uniform rod, is equal to P1 squared, that load squared, times the total length, all divided by two times our, our cross-sectional area A, times our modulus elasticity E. So our strain energy may also be found from the work of a single load P1. So this is our load P1 here. We can go back to our equation 11.2 in our textbook. We have the relationship that our strain energy U is equal to the integral, pay attention to our limits of integration here, from 0 to some x1 of P dx. Now, if we're dealing with an elastic deformation, we have our equation 11.3 in our textbook, where our strain energy U is equal to, now we can see from 11.2, there's our integral from 0 to x1 of P dx. Now, this is equal to 0 to x, the integral from 0 to x1 of kx dx, which is then, we can break that down, do out our math right there, take the integral of that, that ends up being 1 half kx1 squared, which is equal to 1 half P1 x1. So this is our equation 11.3 from our textbook uh, for an elastic deformation. So knowing the relationship between our force and our displacement, we have the following equations down here. We know that our x1 is equal to that load p1 times the total length l cubed all over 3 times the modular elasticity times i there. So this now can come down to our equation 11.37. So if we were to plug this back into our above equation up here for our x1, we plug that in there, then our U, or our strain energy, is equal to 1 half P1, then we plug in this X1 right here from this relationship there, which is our P1 times our L cubed all over 3 EI. We do out the math there, and what we end up with is that U, our strain energy, is equal to P1 squared times L cubed all over 6 EI, which is our equation 11.37 in our textbook. 
So as we continue on with our topic of work and energy under a single load, let's take a look at a couple different types of these single concentrated loads. How do we find our strain and energy for these different types? Well, let's look at three different types of these single concentrated loads. We're going to look at our transverse load, our bending couple, and our torsional couple. So for our transverse load, we'll look at this one first. We have the diagram here. We can see what we have is a cantilever beam with a load at P1. So there's our load at the free end down here at point A. It's our load P1. We can see this is fixed over here at point B to the wall, and it has a length of L. And we can also see that it has this distance down here that is deflected here, this Y1. So for this cantilever beam with that load P1, our strain energy U is equal to our integral from 0 to Y1, right there, going down that direction there, of P, our load P, dy. Now we can do out our integral here, and this becomes 1 half P1, Y1. Now from our equation 11.37, we can see what we can do is we can replace this Y1 right there, and with that we can replace this with our P1 times L cubed all over 3EI there. So that'll be our value for y1. Plug that into this equation here. What we end up with is our u, or our strain energy, is equal to this here, p1 squared l cubed all over 6ei. Again, this relates back to equation 11.37, and this is for a transverse load. So the next type of single concentrated load that we're going to look at here is our bending couple. So we're still dealing with our cantilever beam here, but rather than this load at our free end of P1, what we're dealing with now is a couple here, this M1. So we have this moment M1 on our beam here. So same length beam L from A to B. And now what we can see here, though, is we have this angle d sub 1 right here when we have this moment m1 as our single concentrated load that's applied to this right here. So what we have now is our governing equation that our strain energy u is equal to our integral, where our limits of integration now are from 0 to this the 1 of our m d theta. So then we can do out this integral here. This ends up being 1 half m1 theta 1. So we can come down here, plug in for our theta 1. If we plug in for our theta 1, this is going to be our m1 times the length l all over ei. And this is going to be times m1 times 1 half there. We can do out our math, reduce this down and simplify it. So we find that our strain energy for a bending couple on a cantilever beam is equal to m1 squared times its length l all over 2 ei. And this relates to our equation 11.38 in our textbook. So now let's take a look at our third type of single concentrated load. For this case here, we're going to be looking at our torsional couple. Now with this, we're going to be looking at a cantilever shaft. So we now have a round diameter here, has a total length L, goes from A to B. We can see there's our torque T1 there and our angle Phi1. So for this cantilevered shaft with a torsional couple, we have our governing equation here that U is equal to our integral from 0 to that Phi1 of T, our torque, d phi right there. We can do out that math with our integral. This becomes 1 half t1 phi1. We can plug in for that angle there. So our strain energy u is equal to 1 half t1 times when we plug in for that angle. This is t1l all over our jg. So this is our polar moment of inertia and our modulus rigidity there. And this is equal to, when we do out our math and simplify this down, that u our strain energy is equal to T1 squared L all over 2JG, which is our equation 11.40 in our textbook. So the next thing I want to talk about is our deflection by our work energy method. So in this situation here, if the strain energy of a structure due to a single concentrated load over here, our P, is known, then the equality between the work of the load and the energy may be used to find our deflection. So in this case, our deflection would be our Y sub B. So from this, we can take a look at our structure over here. So we have this CBD frame with that vertical load P. So we have that vertical load acting right there. Now for this here, we know a couple of the geometries here. We have our distance from C to D here as this length L. We know that this guy right here forms a 3, 4, 5 triangle right there for BC. And we have a 3, 4, 5 triangle going the other way for our uh, B to D right there for that member there. So based upon that, we can use this geometry here to find the lengths relative to this L for our BC. So this is our member BC right here, and for our member BD, so this member right here. So let's go ahead and utilize this relationship with our given geometry to find these lengths. So based upon this given geometry, we can see what we have over here is this 3, 4, 5 triangle right there, where the 5 is our load P over here, or our length L, and we can see our 3 is this length over here of CB, and we can see that this length right here for our four, 3, 4, 5 triangle, the 4, is going to be this length of our member BD right there. So let's just redraw that out as two similar triangles. So we have this 3, 4, 5 triangle, and we have this L 
LBC and LBD over here. So for this given geometry, what we can do is say, well, L over five is equal to this LBC over three. So that's exactly what we do here. L over five is equal to LBC over three. We can cross multiply. So we have three L is equal to five times LBC. Let's solve this now for LBC, divide both sides by five. So LBC is equal to three times L over five or 0.6 L. Now we can do the same thing over here. We can say that our L over five again here is equal to our LBD in this case now over four. So again, we cross multiply and we have four L is equal to five times our LBD. Let's divide both sides by five to get our LBD alone. LBD is equal to four L over five, or we have our distance here of LBD is equal to 0.8 L. So now we have a relationship for the length of both of those members for our length of our member BC and our length of our member BD relative to our total length over here of our lowercase l, and we can write these out here. So now that we've had the time to go through and take a look at that given geometry, we've come up with our relationships for the length of our member BC and the length of our member BD. Over here, we saw that the length of BC was equal to 0 0.6 times this length l, and the length of BD is 0 0.8 times that length of l right there. So the next thing that we want to do is from statics, go ahead and determine a relationship for our force BC and our force BD relative to our load P right here, so this load P. So one thing that we want to think about is our sign convention with this. And the way that I like to do this is imagine that we pull on this point P right here. So at B right there, if we were to pull down with P, what would that do to our member BD? And what would that do to our member BC over here? So if we think about that, if we pull down at P, it's going to compress down on this member BD. So pulling down on this one here puts this in compression. So this is going to be a negative 8P here. Whereas when we pull down on P here for our BC, it's going to put this in tension up here. So that's going to be pulling as well. So this is going to be positive. So our FBC is going to be positive relative to our P and our FBD is going to be negative relative to our P just by imagining what happens when we pull down on this point P here. So now from statics what we can do is our equilibrium equations so we can draw out our triangles right here so I draw out our triangle up top for our trig for our force FBC and I do the same thing over here for our force BD so those are our triangles right there so this is our force BD down here and this is our force BC up here we can do out the trig and say okay what forces are acting in our x direction so we take the x component of BC which ends up being a negative four-fifths FBC plus we have a three-fifths FBD is equal to zero there. You can add these together what we end up finding out now if we look at these we can see that BC is going to have a component acting in our negative direction for the X and BD is going to have a component acting in our positive direction there so FBC is equal to a negative 0.75 FBD. Now we can do the same thing in our y direction say okay what forces are acting in our y direction well we've got this force P here then we've got three-fifths of our FBC so if our FBC is right here, we have three-fifths of that to get our, our Y component there. And we're going to have four-fifths of our FBD when we come down here and look at this right here. Set this equal to zero. And what we end up with is we can see we can plug in three-fifths uh, FBC, four-fifths FBD equal to our force P over here. So we're going to have, now we plug in this relationship here between our uh, FBC and our FBD. We can plug that in. What we end up with for this here is we have 0.45 FBD plus a 0.8 F, uh, uh, BD there. When we got rid of our FBC by plugging in for that is equal to P. So we have 1.25 BD is equal to P. So we can rearrange that. Now FBD is equal to a negative 8P. Now why is this a negative right here? Well, we can take a look. Our P is going down and our Y component is going up there. Those should have opposite signs right there. So then we end up with our relationship that we see here for FBC and our FBD. So from there, what we want to do is take a look at the strain energy of our structure. So we have some governing equations that we can plug into. So we're going to look at this for the two different lengths and two different forces. So we'll deal with section BC and then we'll deal with section BD and add those two together. So our strain energy from our basic equation for our section BC right here is equal to our FBC squared times LBC all over 2AE. And for our BD member right here, this is going to be our FBD squared times the length of BD all over 2AE. Now we have those relationships that we solved for down here from our geometry and from our equilibrium equation from statics. We can plug into those and what we end up with is that our strain energy is equal to our P squared times that length L. So this is our P right there and our length L right there times 0.6 to the third 
plus 0.8 to the third all over 2AE, which you can reduce down and simplify this, that our strain energy U is equal to 0 0.364 times our P squared L all over AE. Now from there, we can equate this, uh, equating our work and strain energy. What we can see now is we have this relationship. So we have our value here for our U. So we can plug that in here. So our U is equal to 0 0.364 times our P squared L all over AE, which is equal to our relationship we talked about earlier, one half load times our Y sub B. So we can plug this in, rearrange, simplify, solve for our Y sub B or our deflection that we're looking for. And when we do that, our Y sub B is equal to 0 0.2 of 0 0.728 times our PL over AE. Now, if we were given values for this external load and for this length here, and we knew what material it was and our other dimensions, we could plug in for this relationship here and get a numeric value for our Y sub B. Now, what about the situation if we're using work and energy under multiple loads rather than a single load? So we'll take a look at here is this diagram in the top left where we have a beam with multiple loads. We can see there's our P1 and our P2 acting at our point C1 and C2 here on this beam AB. So the deflections of an elastic beam subject, subjected to these two concentrated loads, P1 and P2, are given by the relationships shown in our equation 11.43 and 11.44, where we have this displacement here, X1 and X2, at the locations of those two concentrated loads. So our X1 is equal to this X11 plus X12 is just equal to our alpha 1 1 times that load p1 plus alpha 1 2 times our load p2 now similarly for our distance over here displacement x2 this is going to be equal to our x2 1 plus x2 2 which is equal to our alpha 2 1 p1 plus alpha 2 2 p2 so now the question is with these variables what are x1 x11 x12 x2 x21 and x22 well, let's take a look at our diagrams over here on the left so if we take a look at the top diagram, which we're considering our part A, this is the deflection due to P1 only. So we can see that's where our X1 is right there. If we're just dealing with P1 only, that's what we have there. So if we're just dealing with this P1, we have that this X11 right here is just simply this X11 right there. And we have over here, if we're just adding this load P1, this distance right here is going to be our X2. But now when we add in our second additional load, this P2, because again, we're dealing with two concentrated loads, then what we have is we have this extra deflection down here, which is this X12, and then we have over here this extra deflection over here of X22. So at the beginning, this X11 and this X21, these distances are just from this concentrated load P1. Then when we add in our load P2, we have these uh, additional deflections right here of X12 and X22. So that's what this is saying here, that this total deflection X1 is equal to x11 plus x12, so x11 plus x12. So our initial deflection just from load P1 and our additional deflection due for when we added load P2. And the same thing for our x2, this is equal to our x21 plus our x22, where our x21, again, is just that deflection from adding that P1. Then when we add our P2, we get this additional x22, so we add those together. So that's where these variables for our x's come in with those subscripts. So now we can take a look at these equations here, and the question is, what is our alpha 1, 2 and alpha 2, 1, our alpha 1, 2 and our alpha 2, 2? Well, let's take a look at these first ones over here in front of our P1s. So our alpha 1, 1 and our alpha 2, 1 are constants called our influence coefficients. Now, these constants represent the deflections at our C1 and our C2 when a unit load is applied at C1 and are the characteristics of the beams. Now, the same thing can be said for our a12 and our A22, but this is when the load is going to be applied at our location C2. So next what we want to do is we want to go ahead and compute the strain energy in the beam by evaluating the work done by slowly applying those loads P1 and our P2 that we see in our diagram. So with that there, we come up with our equation shown in equation 11.48, where our strain energy is equal to one half alpha 1, 1 P1 squared plus two times our alpha 1, 2 times P1 times P2 plus our alpha 2, 2 times our P2 squared. Now, if we were to reverse that application sequence, we would get the following relationship down here in our equation 11.49, where now we have U is equal to one half our A2, 2 times P2 squared plus two times our alpha 2, 1 times P2 times P1 plus our alpha 1, 1 times our P1 squared. Now, a thing that we want to note with this is that our strain energy expressions must be equivalent. So it follows that our A12 is equal to our A21, and this is from Maxwell's, Maxwell's reciprocal theorem. 
Now let's take that same beam with our multiple concentrated loads and apply Castigliano's theorem. So what is Castigliano's theorem? This says that for an elastic structure subjected to some n number of loads, the deflection x sub j uh, of the point of application at p sub j can be expressed by the following. So this is in really general terms here for the number of loads and where our deflections and where our loads are here. So our x sub j is equal to the partial of u uh, with respect to our p sub j. And our theta sub j here is going to be equal to the partial of u with respect to our m sub j there. And we have our phi right here is going to be our partial of u with respect to our torque right there. So whether we're dealing with axial, bending, or torsion, these are going to be our three general expressions using Castigliano's theorem. Now, if we want to calculate our strain energy for any elastic structure subjected to these two concentrated loads, we can go back to our equation 11.48 in our textbook, where our strain energy U is equal to one half the alpha 1, 1, P1 squared, plus two times our alpha 1, 2, P1, P2, plus our alpha 2, 2 times P2 squared. Now, from there, what we want to do is utilize these relationships from Consigliano's theorem there in order to get our deflections there. So what we can see now for this here is we have our du over P1 is equal to our alpha 1, 1, P1, plus our alpha 1, 2, P2, and this is equal to our x1. So what we've done here is we've taken this relationship for u right here, plugged it into our equation up above here, taken the partial with respect to p sub j right there, and that's where we get this relationship that we see in our equation 11.5. Now we can also do this for P2 as well. So our partial of our U with respect to P2 is going to be equal to A12 P1 plus our alpha 22 P2, which is equal to our X2. So this is our X1 displacement and our X2 displacement. So this is how we can still start with our strain energy equation from 11.48 and then utilize these relationship from Castigliano's theorem where we're dealing with a P loads, two concentrated loads, P1 and P2 right here. So we can take the partial of this equation U with respect to P1 in respect to P2 to come up with our equations 11.50 and 11.51. So our application of Consigliano's theorem can be simplified down if the differentiation with respect to our load, P sub j, is performed before the integration or summation in order to obtain our strain energy U. So let's take a look at the top case here, a beam with multiple loads. So in the case of a beam, we have our general governing equation from 11.15 in our textbook where U, our strain energy, is equal to the integral over the whole length, 0 to L, of our m squared all over 2ei dx. Now we also have this relationship over here, which is now 11.57. So if we use Castigliato's theorem to solve for our x sub j, this is our partial of u with respect to our p sub j. So we take the partial of this u right here with respect to p sub j. So this becomes the integral from 0 to l over the whole length of our e, I'm sorry, our m over ei times the partial of m with respect to our p sub j dx. So that's where we take that partial of this relationship u here for the case of a beam. Now, if we're dealing with the case of a truss, as we can see down here in this figure, we have this frame CBD supporting this vertical load P right there. Then what we have for our value for U, our strain energy, this comes from our equation 11.58 in our textbook, where we have the summation from I is equal to 1 to N of, now we have F sub I squared o, times our LI squared all over 2 A sub I E. Now from our equation we saw before to get our x sub j, we have that as the partial of u with respect to that piece of j. So we take the partial of all of this with respect to piece of j. We end up with here is our equation 11.59 where the summation i equals 1 to n of our f sub i, l sub i all over a i e times now the partial of that f sub i with respect to p sub j.